Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, I'm uh, walking around with my ears like this because of my mask, and everybody thinks my ears got bigger or swollen. No, it's just the mask pulling my ears into the front of my face. Hallelujah. Uh, you know our prayer. Our prayer is that here soon and very soon, not only are we going to see the king, yes. but hopefully before then we're able to see each other without fog glasses and masks. Amen. 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 So we want to keep that prayer going. Um, we know that uh, we're to pray for our leaders at this time, and uh, we're to pray, for, and that means all the leaders, even the ones that you don't like, even the ones that you don't agree with. Pray for them. Pray for yes, them. Yes. Pray for them. Yes. Pray for our nation. Pray for our church. Pray for the church of Haywood. Pray for our assembly. Pray for everything you can get your prayer on. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank well, you. I am so blessed to be with you here today. Uh, bear with me for a moment as I. I'll bring up today's lesson, which is part three in our series of the seven churches. Our first part of the series was the introduction. And uh, from the hits on YouTube, uh, it looks like the introduction did better than the, the second, which was the church, uh, the second, uh, the first church. And now we're in the second church, which is part three. Don't be confused. The second part, which is the second church, which is part three. And we're going to be talking about the church of Smyrna. Smyrna. Um, say it. Say it. It's really fun to say it. Smyrna. 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 And uh, the funny thing, and not funny, but uh, uh, uncanny thing about the word Smyrna is it has the word smear in it. Hmm. And there was a great smear campaign against the church of Smyrna. The devil tried to smear Smyrna. Hmm. And God actually allowed the devil to persecute the church for quite some time. Uh, theologians argue yes. uh, whether those 10 days were literal days that they were going to go through the tribulation of uh, uh, persecution in their time, or whether it was through uh, 10 Caesars, 10 rulers, oh. um, or whether it was uh, 10 literal days. Hmm. Um, but the point of the matter is, is that God allows us to go through persecution. Yes. As a matter of fact, the apostles uh, were honored to suffer anywhere close to how Jesus, their Lord and Savior, suffered. They felt a closer kinship. They were honored to suffer unto the Lord. So as we get ready to, um, to get into the Word of God, let us uh, stand if we can, um, bow our heads if we can, as, and, and get prepared for the reading of the Word of the Lord. And this is uh, where we're at, is the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 2, and we are starting in verse 8. So, Revelation, chapter 2, verse 8. I'll give you a moment to get there. Praise God. Amen, amen. And we have to the message of Smyrna, and the word of the Lord says, And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things say the first and the last, which was dead and is now alive. Praise God, which was dead and is now alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know them that blaspheme, who say they are the Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, are the synagogue of of Satan, praise God. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast, shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Hallelujah. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Praise God. Thus saith the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your, your warning and your comfort, Lord. We thank you for your truth, Lord, of your word. You are the truth. Sanctify us with your truth, with your word, into our hearts, into our minds, that we may grow in the grace and the knowledge of you, God. And may you touch our hearts in a special way and our minds in a special way that we might be led to worship you more purely. 
Amen. That we may be led to follow you more closely. Amen. And that we may be led to hear you more clearly and Amen. seek you more diligently. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Hallelujah. We have Amen. a few members here saying, Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. To the seven churches. Hallelujah. What are we talking about here? We're talking about individual churches that were along the trade routes in Asia Minor. And we're talking about literal churches that existed in their times. Uh, some of which still have some part of them standing, some of which are completely decimated in today's day and age. The Church of Smyrna period of this church was around 100 to 313 AD. And it was a large import city on the western coast of Asia Minor. And it was known for its scholastic medicine and scientific endeavors. So this was a how do you do hoity-toity higher learning area. Now what did that mean for that time? Well it means the same thing that it does in this time. You can go to any school, any college, and where they say there's a this is a place of higher education, we know that it is a place of higher idolatry. We know that it is a place of higher uh, blasphemy unto the Lord. We know that it's a higher place that discounts the creation coming from God uh, and, and attributes everything to a Big Bang, uh, which one of my mentors said one of the funniest things he's ever heard, uh, a preacher I, 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 uh, I look up to, he said, one of the funniest things I ever heard in question, that there was a Big Bang. Well, where'd the Big Bang come from? Well, it came from nothing. How can something... How can something come out of nothing? Amen? How can, how can nothing explode? It can't. It has to have a catalyst. And that catalyst, that spark, that fire, that creation comes from the Creator. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. But the churches and the sciences and the schools in their time back then uh, and the places of idol worship, they were, they were immense. And there was many of them. And so we're in a place where... You, you might as well, Smyrna might have been right next door to a college. Imagine if the Church of Haywood was right next door to a college. And as we're walking out of our church, we're getting, you know, tomatoes thrown at us because we're a bunch of fools and, and we believe in God and, and we don't believe in science. And, and we, would be, we would be more persecuted if we were closer to the colleges. I guarantee you that the colleges of our day and age. Well, the Church of Smyrna did not have it easy. But this is how Jesus... God looks at them. And so let's take a closer look at Jesus' description and Jesus' feelings and Jesus' judgment on this church. First, we have to understand that this is a good church in the eyes of the Lord. It's a good church. We want to be a good church. But what does that really mean? Do we have a lot of programs? Maybe. Do we have a lot of studies? Maybe. Uh, do we read the Bible verse by verse? Maybe. Uh, do we have Sunday schools and, and, and programs for all ages? Maybe. But the bottom line of a good church is a church that is willing, willing to, be, to, to, to believe in God, to stay in God, to trust in God, and to live for God. Amen. That's the bottom line. Amen. And then all that other stuff, it just kind of adds to that dynamic. It's not the reason why we're here. We don't come because we have a program. We come because we have a Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 So Jesus is saying this is a good church. And Jesus only commends and praises this church. Hallelujah. Yes. We, we just got church with the, the church of Ephesus. And he said, look, you forgot your first love. You do some things right. But this church did everything right. They did everything right. There was no rebuke from the Lord on this church. Lord, that we could be that church that has no rebuke from you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes. This is the church we need to aspire to be. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a price. Now Jesus paid a price on his cross, but he tells us to pick up ours. Yes. Hallelujah. And so although we will not die the same death he died, because he became all sin, we don't become all sin. Right. He took upon all sin upon himself to save us. We can't save anybody by our death. Hallelujah. Right. Jesus saves us yes. by our death. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus saved us by his death. Praise right. God. But we, we know that this church does good works. Does good works. 
There's just somebody on uh, Twitter the other day that was, you know, sometimes you get these people that come on Twitter and they ask questions just to stir a pot, just to get things going. And so you know that if you answer it, you're going to have to get deep into apologetics and you're going to have to strive for the faith. And this per well, As soon as they start asking these questions, they already know they're going to refute whatever answer you give them. But somebody told this person, this person asked the question, why, why if we're told that we're saved by faith, why does James, in the book of James, not you, Brother James, why does James, but James says the same thing. James and James, they're, they're alike in the fact that they both believe that without faith, without faith, we can't please God, and without works, faith is dead. Faith is dead. And so they both go together. We're not saved by works. We work because we're saved. Praise God. But you, couldn't, you can't tell people, some people, that they think that whatever we do, we do as works. And we're trying to earn our way into heaven. No, we're being grateful unto heaven. I'm going to say that again. We're not trying to earn our way into heaven. We're being grateful and showing our gratefulness through our obedience and our sufferings. We're doing it in our worship. We're doing that because we're grateful that God saved us. Amen. Because he loved us first. While we were yet sinners, he thought of us and died and loved us. Praise God. But this church does good works. Many good works. And they do all these works out of the grace and out of the thankfulness and out of the appreciation of the Lord, for the Lord. Yes. And they do these things out of love for Him. For Him. Because it's all about Him. Praise God. But now, as we take a closer look, because of these things, because they're serving God from a true heart, because they're saved, because they truly repented and received Jesus Christ, they are about to receive persecution. The worst thing we can tell a new believer is once you're saved, life is going to get easier and more full of joy for you. Well, it's going to, it's going to get harder, but there's still going to be more joy and power in your life. You're going to be able to overcome things you never thought you'd be able to overcome. You're going to be able to change into a person you never thought that you could be. But God saw who you were before you knew who you were. Amen. Praise God. But if you're going to serve God, you're going to anger the enemy. Bottom line. And now you're a target. You come out of that water, hallelujah, I'm saved. You better check your back because there's a target. The devil now has said, all right, all right, you're one of, you're one of God's. I'm, I'm not going to let that just be like that. I'm coming after you. And so that's why you've got to fill yourself with his spirit. That's why you've got to fill yourself with his word. That's why you've got to surround yourself with his people. Yes. Praise God. You have got to keep yourself yes. prepared for the attacks of the enemy. Prepared for persecution. Yes. Now, persecution at the hands of various Roman emperors, Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus, Aurelius, if I said that right, uh, historically, the period represented by the Smyrna Church may, be, may well be called the Age of Martyrdom. How do you like to be in the Age of Martyrdom? There's some countries right now, China, right? Uh, uh, India, there's some countries, they, they don't take well the Christians. We think that we're suffering here. We're not suffering as many Christians suffer around this globe. Amen. And so we need to we need to check ourselves when we say, "Oh, I'm I'm being I'm being persecuted." Somebody at work doesn't want to talk to me and ignores me because I'm a Christian. Right. I feel so horrible. Well, at least you're still alive. Because in another country, they might have just killed you. They might have just stoned you, chopped off your head. Praise God. We don't know what it is yet to be persecuted, as others already know what it is to be persecuted. But the time is coming. And like Brother Pete said, we can hurt some people's feelings by telling the truth. But we have to tell the truth. We have to. And we appreciate your grace if you would just give us some as authors, uh, uh, as, uh, authors of, of what we feel. Amen. What we feel in our hearts. I'm the author of what I feel. Right. But I'm, God is the author of what he says. And so, even though I may feel certain ways and for certain things, I, I need your grace because I still got to, even though I might feel certain ways about certain things, I can't, I can't deny the word of God. Amen. And I've got to preach it. Yes. And the end times are here. There are antichrists. There's been many little antichrists. And the antichrist is getting ready. Hallelujah. And whether you believe that we're going to go through the tribulation or we're not, I tell you what. If we go through the tribulation, we do. If we don't go through the tribulation, we don't. But guess what? 
it's going to continue to get worse until the time. So, you know, it's, it's just a mere uh, uh, cause and effect of the measures that are about to come upon us. So, if you went back several, you know, thousand years into, into Roman territory, and you were persecuted, it would be a lot different than, than today. Amen. And, but you have to understand that time, time is in God's hands. And he will appoint the time when he takes us. We don't appoint that time. And so if there's going to be tribulation, which he said there is, and he said there is going to be trouble, he says, you're going to have to deal with it. But don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good during the time. Right. Hallelujah. That's easier said and easier repeated than it is completed. Right. It's easier repeated than completed. Hallelujah. There is a cost for doing right. The Bible tells us that the world is not our home. That the, we have nothing. We are the light, and the world is full of darkness. And the darkness is not going to comprehend what we're doing. And yet, we must go out into the darkness and preach the gospel into a dark and dying world that some might be saved. Yeah. And so, we have been called co-laborers. We have been called to do a duty. And sometimes people take offense of this as ministers of the Lord and pastors and bishops and and whatever uh, big high high convolutin highfalutin titles you can give us. But the bottom line is, is we're all called to die. <laughs> we're called to die unto ourselves. And possibly die at the hands in martyrdom. That's really what we're called for. Hallelujah. We die daily, Paul says. Praise God. So there's a cost to doing right. There's a cost to living holy. There's a cost to being humble. There's a cost to being faithful to God. There is a cost. And the cost comes in the payment of persecution. Praise God. If you want to know what it's like to be persecuted, ask Jesus. Jesus said, don't, don't think it's you that they're persecuting. It's me, Jesus said. They're persecuting me. The world hates Jesus. They don't hate if you say the word God. But when you specify that word and you say, in that G-O-D is J-E-S-U-S, then they're going to start having a problem. Hallelujah. You wear that, you wear that shirt. They're going to beat you for wearing a MAGA hat. They're going to beat you for wearing uh, the red, white, and blue. But if you wear a, a, a shirt that says, you all need Jesus, you just wait for it to come. Yeah. Hallelujah. Wear a Jesus shirt to school. Yeah. One boy did. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Got kicked out. Hallelujah. You <laughs> try to pray in the office uh, of, 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 uh, of your manager. <laughs> just come walk right in and say, I'm going to start praying. Watch out. You'd be amazed how fast you might just be led out and fired. But we are called to be persecuted. So we can't be afraid of the retaliation of the enemy. And we can't be afraid of the retaliation of the unbelievers. We have to expect it. It must be expected. It must be expected. Perfect like an example of somebody who is a highfalutin, convolutin, high-titled man of God is the Apostle Paul. The teacher of teachers, the learner of learners, the Pharisees of Pharisees. Amen? And what did, what if you go into the book of Acts, uh, chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said this to Ananias, who was good to meet Paul and to help him in his uh, transformation, let's call it. But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, go your way. For he, that is Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me. I'm choosing Paul. God chooses us. God chooses you. As a chosen vessel to bear my name. We're chosen to bear his name as the apostle Paul was. Before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And this is what God says whoo, to Ananias about the apostle Paul. Great man of God. For I will show him how great things he must suffer mm. for my name's sake. Wow. Ever read it like that? Ever, ever understand it? That I, he is a chosen vessel. He is an instrument. How do you like to be called an instrument? Well, I don't feel like a guitar. 
Hallelujah. But some people do play me real easy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Play me by my heartstrings. But uh, but but I'm an instrument. I'm a, I'm a man. I'm a husband. I'm a stepfather. I'm a son-in-law. I'm an employee. I'm a son. Uh, you know, I'm a brother. But uh, I'm a child of God. But but to God, not only am I His child, but I am His instrument. What does that mean? That means God can pick me up and use me any way He desires. Any way he wills. Amen. And I need to say exactly that, sister. Yeah. Amen. 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 I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to take you over here and you're going to preach over here. And I got to say, well, I don't want to be in the belly of a fish, so yes, Lord. I want you to go over there and do this. Okay, yes, Lord. Praise God. We have got to understand where our duties and loyalties lie first and foremost. And that's with the word and the commands of God. So we are going to be persecuted for Jesus' namesake. Amen. Namesake. Yes. I challenge you not to go up to your bishop and tell him, hey, you know what? You're just an instrument. You're just an instrument. Don't do that. That's not what we're saying here. They are a powerful instrument of the Lord. Paul was a powerful instrument instrument of the Lord and he suffered many things and he told us how many things he suffered he suffered shipwrecks and, and, and scourgings and being whipped and being bitten by snakes and being bitten and being thrown in jail have, have, have you gone through that I haven't yet I pray I don't want to go through that nobody wants to go through that nobody wants to take up their cross because they know how painful it's going to be and some people, you know, especially in the scientific community, they, they believe that we're, we're, we're ludicrous in our belief of Jesus and our belief of God because they think that God is some kind of masochist. God loves to, to, to cause pain and suffering on his children. God wasn't a masochist. Adam and Eve were. <laughs> Adam and Eve, for some reason, weren't happy enough being with God. They wanted more. And they allowed the temptation of desiring more than they already had. And then they ended up in the same place as the devil. And we're right here, right along with them. This is the devil's land. And we're subject to the world, the flesh, and the devil while we're here. And once you're saved in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and hallelujah, once you have all that, once you are one of God's, you are going to be a target for the enemy. 1 Peter 3.14 says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Who easier said than none. But this is from Peter, who was also jailed, who also denied Jesus three times and was restored out of the grace of God, yeah. who could have fallen into the same pit of hell that Judas fell into if it wasn't for the grace and love of Jesus. You know, Peter was a denier of Christ. And Christ still took him back because he was a chosen vessel to suffer for the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. So how can we take something home from this? How can we be like the church of Smyrna? I want us to be a suffering church. I want us to be a suffering church. Now, does that mean I'm praying for calamity to fall upon us? No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I want us to truly be able to see our suffering. Because some of the things that we suffer, we don't even realize we're suffering. We're suffering at the hands of our own family members. We're suffering at the hands of our, of our own cities and states and local authorities. We're suffering at the hands of our own spouses or our own children. Because Jesus said a prophet is not without honor except where? In his own country. Jesus went back to Nazareth and he could only do a few miracles because the Holy Ghost couldn't move the way. <laughs> there was too many unbelievers and half of them were in Jesus' family. What, what kind of stigma do you think was attached to Jesus when he went back to, to his home, his homeland, to Nazareth? Oh, that's the carpenter's son. Yeah, isn't that Mary's kid? The one, the, Ill the illegitimate one? The one that always, 
Born of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, right, sure. Yeah, uh-huh. Can you imagine the condemnation? Can you imagine the persecution? Can you imagine the backbiting and people whispering behind that family's back? I got news for you. People are whispering behind your back. You're insane. You're crazy. Ah, I can't believe that you think that going to church is going to help you. Let's go have a beer. Ah, I can't believe that you don't use foul language and you try to, but what are you, what are you, holier than thou? And then you say, no, 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 no. I don't do this because I'm holy. I do this because God's holy. And his holiness needs to come through me. I'm just the same as you, except I've been saved by grace. So now I'm not the same as you. <laughs> Does that mean I'm better than you? The truth is yes. <laughs> not in the way that they think, though. We're not better than them because we're better than them. But better is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Praise God. The only thing better in me is Jesus. Hallelujah. So how can we be like this church? First and foremost, we must not be ashamed of the word of God. And some of you I know say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Praise God. But then when people are talking about certain things and you, the, the Holy Ghost comes inside you and says, you should say something. And you go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if I say something, they're going to make fun of me. And then you don't say it, then you're ashamed. <laughs> We've all been ashamed at one time or another of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, out of fear of being made fun of, condemned, or ostracized, or fired. <laughs> Praise God. But I tell you what, the best thing I started to do in my walk with the Lord is to make sure that everybody knows who I am wherever I go. And that doesn't mean I go, hey, I'm a minister. Hey, I'm a minister. Hey, you know, I'm a minister. No, when people ask me questions, and it always happens at every job I've ever had, why do you act in this way? They ask. And as soon as they ask, I tell. And that's it. That's it. If you live like Christ, you're going to be asked why. If you're not asked why you're living like Christ, then you're not living like Christ. Praise God. Now, some of you, you work with people and you're surrounded by people who are from the church all the time. Barely do you see outsiders or fellowship or have any kind of doings with the outsiders, with the world and the lost. Now, it's time to get out. <laughs> not now, of course, you know, unless you get out with your mask and, and from a six feet distance say, repent! <laughs> Praise God. But it's time to break out of our shells, church. We can't just let this situation keep us where we're at. I have a platform. I'm so blessed. I have a platform. Thank you, Pastor, for this platform. Thank you, Brother Peter uh, Jr., for this platform. Thank you, Brother James. Thank you, every, all the ministers who allow me this, this silly gringo to be in this church. You know, I'm blessed. I have I have a place for my ministry. And this place goes from here to my job, to my home, to my friends, to my family. It goes everywhere I go. But the truth of the matter is not everyone is blessed with the ability to preach from a pulpit. And so therefore, you are more desired by the Lord to, to preach from wherever you're at. And so we need to start preaching to our children and our great-grandchildren and our grandchildren and our family members. Praise God. We need to start talking about things that are serious because things are getting serious. Praise God. And we can't be afraid of them kicking us out of their house or not calling us anymore. I don't know about you. If anybody has family members that don't talk to you anymore because you chose the Lord, raise your hand. Now, see, some of you want to raise your hand, but you're not going to. Ah, there you go, brother Pete Jr. That's right, that's right. So, Pete, you know what it's like. You know what it's like. Because you choose God, they choose to, 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 to make fun of you or not speak with you or, or separate themselves from you. We can't control that. We must expect that. We must expect that. Jesus didn't say, don't go into the home. He said, go into the home. And if they reject you, then dust off your feet and go into the next one. He didn't say, don't go into another one ever again. Crawl into a hole. He said, continue preaching and teaching the gospel. Amen. Continue. So we cannot be ashamed. We have to keep our passion for Jesus. Then, not only can we not be ashamed, but we cannot be afraid. 
Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have a level of fear. Somebody holds a knife or a gun to my head, I'm going to be afraid. I can say that I'm not afraid, okay? <laughs> but my body's going to tell me something different as I'm shaking in my boots, okay? So, yes, I'm going to be afraid because the natural instinct of a human being when their life is in jeopardy is fight or flight. But what the Bible tells us is, in that fear, stand. That's not being afraid. Not being afraid in the biblical way is even through the fear, even through the natural fear, we have a spiritual boldness that, uh, that transcends that fear. Amen? Amen? Do you think, do you think that when Jesus saw those stripes coming, that whip coming, he didn't anticipate the pain and fear that pain? Do you think when he was praying on the rock, bleeding, uh, sweating blood, that he wasn't, uh, uh, his body and his, his soul wasn't torn apart at the fear of what was going to happen? But guess what? He overcame the fear with his faith and his obedience. Amen. And that is the kind of not afraid we need to be. Right. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's just a shadow. Right. Because you can kill me here, but you can't kill me there. Right. Only God can do that. <laughs> Only God can take me from here and Amen. take me from there and put me down there. <laughs> not ashamed. Not afraid of suffering. Not afraid of pain. Not afraid of being smeared. There should be a smear campaign out on you. You, can, you should be able to find it out. I got people I know who hate me. Brother Pete, you're not the only one. <laughs> I know you know it. I have, I have my enemies. Yeah. I have my enemies. Yeah. I have people who are my brethren that dislike me. And I know that they do. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't love me as a brother, but they just can't stand me as a person. And that's okay. That's okay. But they're not persecuting me. Right. Amen? Because brotherly love overpowers right. the opinion. Right. Praise God. Together, though, we stand. Yeah. We stand. Yeah. That's the bottom line. And we stand in not being afraid of that suffering, not being afraid of that smear. And you can say what you want about me, but you better be careful what you say about him. Praise God. So not ashamed, not afraid, and finally, not moved. Smyrna didn't move. Smyrna didn't say, ah, it's getting really hard here. We're being persecuted. You know what? We're poor. The, the, the society around us is not letting us uh, uh, profit. They're not letting us keep up our building. They're not letting us get good jobs. As a matter of fact, it, it is a, a, a controversy within theologians that the Church of Smyrna was being so persecuted that they were really poor because they couldn't they couldn't handle being with the area in the in the world that they were in in the city that they were in. There was really no place for them. They were condemned at every angle, in every store, in every in every you know house of, of evil worship, and in, in every grocery store and marketplace. They were they were constantly constantly ostracized and uh, and and uh, persecuted. So can you imagine that, right? Can you imagine that? Well, we need to be like them. They said, you know what? You might not let us move here, but we're not moving. <laughs> You might, you might stop us from moving here or moving there, but you're not moving us. We're not moving. We're right. staying right where we are. Can you imagine right now the Church of San Francisco, the, the Apostolic Church in San Francisco? Did they move or are they still there? My brother is out there in San Francisco, a great great pastor and, and, and another brother of mine, a uh, uh, great red, red-headed man of God, man, and, and I went to Bible college with him. Uh, praise God. They're still there. They're still there. San Francisco is becoming a dung heap. It's becoming a refuse place. It's becoming a place of needles and garbage and, and, and destruction and, and human feces on the ground. And yet they stay and they preach. They shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. Come hell or hot water. Lest it be the word of God telling us we must go. Here, God is telling the church of Smyrna, you're going to go, <laughs> but you're going to go to jail. But don't be afraid, don't worry. Even unto death, don't worry. How comforting is that? Even unto death. Brother James, even unto death, right. don't, don't worry. Right. Brother Steve, even unto death, don't worry. Well, that's easy to say. Even unto death, don't worry. Right. 
And here you got you know, the Apostle Peter hanging upside down on a cross. Don't worry, Peter. You got, you got, right? The Apostle John on the island of Patmos. Hey, man, don't worry. And they're like, okay, I'm not worried, but I can sense pain and suffering is coming. Yeah, yeah. And so, of course, I have that human fight or flight that's in my body, that's in my soul, that's in my being, that I have to put under subjection to the Lordship of Jesus. Right. We're all going to have our Gethsemane at some, time, at some point. Well, we're going to have to decide that the suffering is better than the alternative. Right. Either we become like the world or we suffer. Either we persecute and, and destroy our, our flesh, kill our flesh, or we become like the world, the flesh, and the devil. Either we deny all the anti-Christ precepts that are coming at us from every direction, or we succumb to it and we end up in hell. What do we do? We stand. We will not be moved by the world, by the flesh, or by the devil. So we got to prepare for this kind of persecution. I don't know if this persecution is coming anytime soon in my lifetime, but I think some people here believe it is, possibly in their lifetime. And so don't don't try to the, the elders of the church for saying that this is this is getting bad. They've been around a lot of bad. Somebody who's been in, in, in this life over 70 years, some over 80 years, they've seen 80 years full of prosperity and full of famine. Prosperity and famine. Ease and hardship. Ease and hardship. And I wager that the hardship was more than the ease. So when they say, look, things are getting really bad. They've been through really bad. <laughs> Amen. They've been through two world wars. Praise God. They've been through Vietnam. They've been through the, the, the 1930s, many of them, through the Depression, the Great Depression. Some of us my age and younger, we have no clue what it's like to suffer. But they do. So you better start asking young people. You better start asking. When I say young people, I mean if you're younger than 50, <laughs> you better start asking the elders of your church what they've been through so that you can get some perspective on your prosperity that you've had all your life because we're going to have to give some of it up we're going to have to give some of this prosperity up and we're not going to give it up willingly it's going to be taken from us when we suffer we suffer physically mentally spiritually financially so the first thing we must do is we must know our god i'm going to write these things down please do preparing for persecution number one know your god 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when, this, when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Know your God. Know who He is. Know where He stands on every issue and stand with Him. So know your God. Number two, know each other. Know one another as brethren. Know each other. Do you know your brethren like you should? 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So be prepared to share your persecution and be prepared to share your encouragement and, and be prepared to share a positive word with your friendly neighbor of God, your brother and sister in the Lord, to lift them up because they're going through something. Praise God. Know your God. Know each other. Know the three enemies. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you, like Paul, I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Do not think that the world loves you. You get involved in the things of the world and it feels good for a minute, not because the world wants you to be with it, to be happy. The world is owned by the devil and they want your destruction. Know the world. Know the flesh. Know your... Know the devil. The problem that we have most of the time as a modern church, as a modern brethren, as a modern body of Christ is our own flesh. We don't mind binding the devil, hallelujah. 
We have no problem with that. Kicking them in the teeth. Hallelujah. We got no problem saying no to the world. We won't act like you. We have no problem with that. But when it comes to our own flesh having dominion in our lives, oh, that's another story. Right. You got to know your own flesh. Right. You got to know your own strengths and your own weaknesses and give them to the Lord for Him to use as vessels of right. honor. Right. Praise God. Know your enemies. So know your God, know each other, know the, your three enemies. And uh, number uh, one, two, three, no, number four, no suffering. Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that he must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God without tribulation. Have you had tribulation? You're on your way to heaven. Have you had tribulation? The world hates you. Have you had tribulation? The world sees Jesus in you. How do you know you're saved? Because you love your brothers and sisters? Because you love those who persecute you. You know that you're saved because you have love. But you also know that you're saved because those who are not saved want you dead. <laughs> Hallelujah. And number five, know the victory. Know the victory. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Have you been persecuted? Are we going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake? I tell you what we're persecuted for right now. We're persecuted for following the rules <laughs> of this COVID-19 crisis. We're persecuted for not opening up the church like some, some churches have. We're persecuted for agreeing with, uh, you know, whatever whatever laws and rules uh, that, that are put out. We're persecuted for uh, sometimes being a cult because we're so charismatic about the Lord. Because we believe that God is not just uh, a, a God of the mind, but he's a God of the heart. And so they persecute us for that because many Christians just like staying on the surface mental level of God. But we take it all the way through into the spirit. And so we're persecuted for that. We're persecuted for some of the decisions that people have made in, in, in our faith and for some of the controversies that have happened. But I, 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 I tell you what, you, you go and find me the perfect church and then you go there and I'll tell you what, it won't be perfect anymore. There is no perfect church, but there is a church that is faithful. There is a church that does good works. There is a church that is persecuted for the namesake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that church was the church of Smyrna. And we want to be like the church of Smyrna. We don't want a rebuke. We want only condemn, uh, commendation, excuse me, commendation from the Lord. But we're going to have to work together for that. We're going to have to work on ourselves, on our relationship with the Lord, and with each other. And then we're going to have to stay in the Lord at all times. Praise God at all times. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Can you pray for the President of the United States? Can you pray for Nancy Pelosi? Can you pray for AOC and Kamala Harris? Can you pray for that minister uh, who went on TV and wanted everybody to give him money so he could have a private jet so he wouldn't have to fly with the normal people? Can you pray for him? I'm not going to mention his name. Can you pray for the several ministers who have gotten caught with women of ill repute committing adultery against their wives? Can you pray for them? And you say, oh, they're, they're all hypocrites. They're all evil. We're all striving. We're all trying. We all fall short of the glory of God. And every church makes mistakes because it's full of people who are battling the world, the flesh, and the devil on a regular basis. And sometimes we just open up a door a little too much for one of the enemies. And they come in and they take over. And that's all it takes for some of us. And then the devil makes his big old chest move and he thinks he can knock down the church. But he can't. What did, what, what, what did Jesus say about the church? What can't destroy the church? The gates of hell cannot destroy 
the church. The keys to the kingdom have been given to the church. And so we might suffer. But Paul said, hey man, compared to the sufferings that I'm going through, the things that are in heaven are nothing. Are ever. I mean, once you get it, once, once you leave this mortal coil, hallelujah, praise God, you're going to say, I can't believe I held on to so much down there. <laughs> hallelujah. I can't believe I didn't see it more clearly. I can't believe how glorious it truly is to be in the everlasting living presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That is more important to me than I may lose my life. If I lose it, that's fine because I Jesus found it. <laughs> Jesus found my life. I was lost, but now I'm found. And so somebody can take my life, but they can't bring me into the second death. The Lord said to this church, you will not suffer the second death. You will not go into that lake of fire. And you will be preserved for eternity. That's the hope. Because we're called to take up our cross. Amen. We're called to deny ourselves. Yes. We're called to suffer. But at the end, there's the crown of life. At the end, there's the glory of the Lord. At the end, there's the streets of gold. At the end, there's presence and fulfillment of the love of the Lord forevermore. In His presence is what? Fullness of joy. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Let us be more like the church of Smyrna every day. Every day. Amen. Praise God. And let us prepare for the persecution to come. Whether by this day, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or a thousand years from now, yeah. it's coming and it's gonna come. Hit us stronger and harder. And we must be prepared to know our God, to know ourselves, to know each other, to know the victory, to know our suffering, and to know our enemies. Because we have to know that victory. And victory, is Jesus. The victory belongs to the Lord. Till next time. God bless you. Praise God.